Thanks, everybody. My name is Alyssa Cohn. I'm an executive coach, and I'm the author of From Startup to Grown Up, and I also write for Forbes. <laughs> and it is an honor and a delight and a joy today to be with these incredible folks from Latin America who are going to specifically be telling us about what is sort of the secret sauce that has been permeating Latin America. Everybody who knows startups knows that this has been a rocket ship story over the past number of years. So Miriam, I'm going to start with you and just ask you, what is the status of the Latin America scene right now in terms of startups? It's been a macro environment shift, of course. What, what, what have you seen in terms of trends in Latin America? Um, it's a very exciting time for Latin America in general. Um, we have seen the race of unicorns all around, you know, uh, our countries in Latin America. Uh, we have seen new companies, new technologies, uh, people taking the market, taking, you know, uh, different other emerging markets as well, uh, you know, growing up a very strong ecosystem that, that didn't happen, uh, for example, seven, six years ago when the ecosystem was in a very early stage. And just pre-pandemic, we had around 12, 11 unicorns, and during the pandemic, we doubled it, wow. uh, which is, uh, you know, a phenomenon we, we also saw here in Canada and some other countries as well. I think the pandemic actually accelerated the, um, uh, you know, funding and, and it put some companies really in a strong way. So that's why we have seen, uh, or we are seeing right now, all these strong fintech companies and other type of companies in technology that are coming with really great solutions to the market. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Have you seen anything now with the macro sort of slowdown? Have you seen the sort of a concomitant slowdown in Latin America yet? Or is what is happening right now in the ecosystem? Yeah, so uh, I think we are going to see, um, and not just in Latin America, I think uh, we are seeing it in the world, basically a slowdown. Um, uh, many people are talking about depression, they are talking about, you know, funds getting away, uh, you know, or, or coming back again conservative, uh, you know, in, in actually putting money in early stage startups or those that don't have traction. That's a reality, that's something that we are going to be facing in the next two, three years. Yeah. So I believe that the companies um, that we are seeing right now with sales traction that are focusing in to actually get a um, customer base instead of just uh, you know investment and funding are going to probably survive. And those that are also focusing in Web 3.0, yes. everything that is uh, related with um, cybersecurity, cryptocurrency, you know, th those are very exciting solutions that probably are going to, in some limitations, survive this depression that is going to happen global base. Super helpful. You know, at times like this, when you see a slowdown of an ecosystem, you really think about the network needing to build together. You, uh, Pedro, you run a network. Tell us a bit about the network of folks that you have building the ecosystem and how and why that's so important. Yeah, you know, when we think about Latin America, we think about natural wonders, captivating landscapes, magnificent uh, rivers, mountains, uh, white sand beaches, ruins. It's really like a great uh, place, right? But we also have several challenges, several problems. It's more than 35 different countries with different political, social, and economic uh, situations. It's 600 million people, 200 million of them live in poverty, mm -hmm. and that's a really big thing that we collectively need to address. That's why having these networks, uh, either private networks, public networks, or pu public-private partnership networks, helps bring common ground to address these huge, big problems, to not only create uh, economic impact, but also to create social and environmental impact, right? These networks help us uh, create this triple bottom line of three Ps, people, profit, and, uh, and planet that really can address the fundamental problems that our society has and that these 200 million people uh, that live in poverty need. Yes, so important to bring together various constituencies to then really seed the soil of success. And speaking of success, we have Juan Pablo here, and you are the co-founder of one of the unicorns of Latin America, Rapi, and now the co-founder and CEO of a new Latin America startup. Tell us about what it was like 
and, and your journey building Rapia now you know in light of the ecosystem there in Latin America? Yeah, everything has changed completely. Seven years ago, um, USBCs were around. They didn't want to invest in Latin America. There was um, a lot of just issues all around it. Um, for us, I think all of that, all of those problems and all of that pushback uh, help us build Rappi and the stage it is today. So fast forward seven and a half years, Today, we are, um, as Miriam saying, an amazing time to build companies in Latin America. We have funding uh, from all over the world coming into the region, a region that really needs funding and that has many different problems. And the more problems we're able to solve, the more we can advance uh, the whole region. So uh, we're in, I would say, difficult times, but at the same time, these are the best times to build great companies. A couple of months ago, it was much easier to raise uh, money, but still today, all of the VCs are eager to invest in the region. All of the VCs are looking for great entrepreneurs that want to come and solve one of the thousand problems that, that we have in the region and in a way help with all the macroeconomic problems. If each entrepreneur dedicates themselves to solving one problem, we're going to have an impact in the macroeconomic um, aspect of the region. And we see this in Rapid World Building. Uh, we have been able to, to make millions of jobs. Uh, we today operate in nine different countries. We deliver millions of orders. So you can see how a single startup can actually make a great impact macroeconomically in a big region. Definitely. I'm going to double click on that in a minute. But even before I do, if you picture yourself, what, probably seven, eight years ago, thinking about the founding of Rappi with just a few people, and then the, the, the sort of the building of that, was there a moment that you can share with us about what that was like when you kind of realized that you were on this rocket ship, you were building this rocket ship, and what it would mean for the economy. Can you kind of give us one moment that really capsulizes that? I, I think from the beginning, you, we never thought we were going to become a unicorn when we started Rapid. Like we have a simple idea. We wanted to do really quick deliveries. Uh, we wanted to build two apps, one for couriers, one for users, and see where it went. And we were launching in Mexico. We were launching in Colombia. We never thought we were going to be in nine different countries. Um, so I think focus on, on solving that specific problem, listening to the user, and then just growing is how everything happened. So if you fast forward to today, and I look back and I say, OK, seven years ago, was I thinking Rapid was going to be this big? I will never uh, thought of that. But it was just uh, focusing on the problems that we're seeing at the moment, uh, pivoting really fast so we were able to, if we find a problem, solve it and move on and find the next challenge. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Miriam, you, we talked earlier about the fact that on the one hand we say Latin America, like it's sort of a monolithic area, but actually you're very acquainted with all the different regions, pieces, countries, cities that make up that. Could you give us a flavor of some of the differentiating factors inside of Latin America? Oh yeah, uh, we um, we discuss that uh, all the time with uh, you know Canadians here. Um, we have the Pacific Alliance, which is um, we have some similarities in between those countries, um, just because of the economics and all that. Which is Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. That economic block is almost 50 percent of uh, you know the uh, power economy in, in, in the region. Uh, it has a lot of similarities with uh, certain sectors in North America. Um, and also have some FTAs uh, with Canada and the States. You know, it's a little bit easier sometimes for uh, com uh, companies in Canada or in the States to do business with companies in the Pacific Alliance. Then we have Brazil, which is the other major market, uh, you know, also, you know, with a lot of potential, of course, uh, you know, it's the one that drives also the other 50%, almost 50% of the region. And then we have Argentina and Uruguay always coming with very disrupt, uh, disruptive type of technologies. Uh, I like to say sometimes that uh, you know, Uruguay is kind of the secret weapon in Latin America, because it's such a tiny country, uh, but it has a lot of uh, you know, good technologies. It's a good ecosystem, very strong, very different from uh, the others. So if you see, for example, Argentina and Uruguay tend to uh, be focusing a lot in what is FinTech. Mm -hmm. Uh, agricultural technology uh, coming from them, 
Um, we saw, for example, a, a raise of Bitcoin in Argentina in 2014 after the crisis that, that, that happened there. So uh, we saw one of the first uh, or the first uh, Bitcoin ca uh, cash machine in Uruguay in the world. Mm -hmm. It was the first one. And wow. the second one is in Vancouver. Uh, we have IoT in Mexico. Uh, we have uh, SaaS solutions in Colombia and, you know, um, other type of platforms like uh, Rappi, you know, fintech companies also in Colombia. So it depends where you go. Really, you will have different type of solutions and the countries tend to be focusing in, in se certain sectors that are not necessarily related 100% with the commodities that traditional has been, uh, you know, um, uh, growing those, uh, those countries. Yeah, that's so helpful. And I think everyone needs to get up to speed right on the different pieces of, of, that er of this area. Um, Pedro, something that we talked about earlier is that, well, ev we all spoke about the just genuine challenges that exist in society there. And specifically what you said earlier is a successful company cannot thrive in a failed society. Maybe you could double click in a more specific way on the real challenges that are the specific to the region and then maybe some solutions. And I'm gonna ask the two of you to do the same after I hear from Pedro. Yeah, definitely we cannot have successful companies in failed societies. Just like we cannot have successful societies without successful companies. So yeah. they both go hand on hand. What we're seeing in the last uh, years as a result of these challenges, social unrest, political unrest, uh, poverty, uh, deforestation, etc., is that it is impact investment what is becoming a trend in Latin America. Meaning if you have businesses, projects, that really do good, not just for your P&L, but for society and for the environment, you will, found, you will find not just VCs, but also a problem that needs to be addressed. So uh, Miriam was just talking about uh, Uruguay. Costa Rica is another example. Costa Rica is a country that runs on uh, renewable electricity all the electricity is renewable. So that's a reason for many companies to come and operate in Costa Rica from data centers to uh, advanced manufacturing uh, projects because companies think that they are doing something good for humanity, good for the planet. And, you know, and on top of that, you have uh, peace, you have democracy, you have uh, rule of law, you have uh, uh, tax incentives, grants, etc. That's the perfect ground to do business in, in Latin America. Of course, Latin America, as any emerging region, implies uh, risk. Uh, that's the nature of emerging markets. But with big risk, there's big reward. So uh, it, it's definitely uh, something to, to, to consider because there is 600 million people there needing solutions to their problems. Yeah, definitely. Miriam, do you have something to add to that in terms of the specific ris risks you see in your role in terms of bringing developing countries and certainly Latin America here into Canada. Uh, could you please, please? Uh, Just do you, have something else to, do you have something else to add to the challenges oh, that get faced in the region? Yeah, in, in general, I believe that, uh, you know, the challenges that we face in the region is the constant, um, uh, uh, you know, um, changes in, in government sometimes, uh, you know, make nervous the uh, investors. Uh, you know, you can see uh, some government can change from one, uh, one party to the other in very extreme ways. Uh, but if, for example, what we have seen in the last elections, I think it's something that we have seen also in the States, we have seen in Europe, it's kind of like a polarizing, uh, you know, uh, the population. And sometimes the investors can be a little bit afraid of that. And that also, um, you know, make the companies a little bit afraid when they see investors afraid, you know, so how we grow, how we, you know, tackle this challenge. Uh, and I believe the best solution for the companies, again, for now, just focus and grow uh, your customer base. Yeah. And uh, you know, they, they can tackle that challenge. But I think in, in the region has been perceived internationally as that main challenge, that constant you know, change in political and economic behavior that sometimes make people nervous about the region in general. Yes, volatility can often be a, sort of a risky thing to think about funding. You know, Juan Pablo, you and I spoke um, a while ago about your own personal aspirations for the region, and you, you're thinking that building RAPI, and now you know, 
can offer so much to the region. Can you talk about maybe some of the networks and companies that have spun out of RAPI that gives you hope? Yeah. I think before we get into that, um, there are many challenges that throughout the years have been kind of solved. Uh, one of them is infrastructure. Yeah. It was extremely hard to open a bank account in Mexico seven years ago. I remember when I was first trying to get the, the account for Rappi, we were working at co-working and the bank didn't understand how I had a physical location that wasn't my location and I had only had a desk. Uh, all of these things are fixed and it has been fixed um, by different companies. Uh, you have GIFs, you have Clara, you have all of these corporate car startups that enable any company to fast uh, get a credit card, which something was uh, on think of. And then you also have the second challenge you see is uh, incorporating a company in Colombia or in Mexico or in Brazil is a really lengthy process. And for us, seven years ago, it was impossible to hire someone if we didn't have a company. Today, you have deal, uh, you have on top, you have all these different companies that for me in, in Juno, after one week after we founded Juno, we were having uh, people getting hired in Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, without even having a company. So these are the kind of things that with technology from outside the region, from inside the region, it enables just companies to focus on what they want to do and not focus on incorporating a company, which was a problem that I had. Um, coming back to, to your question, um, well, we, we have seen over 50 companies grow from ex rapi employees and I'm pretty sure you have heard the Rappi Mafia comparing to the PayPal Mafia. I don't think that's a good word to, to characterize what is happening. I like to call it the Rappi Angels because you just have all these different people uh, from us being angel investors into the companies to just people that learn for many years how to build a, a, a startup and how to forget about the impediments that you normally have of like building a company's hard. So, it has become kind of like a training ground at the Stanford of Latin America for people to come and see that everything is possible, that you can actually build unicorns in Latin America, and then they're now living and building companies. There are more than 50 now, so you know is one of them, but we're going to keep seeing this happening. And it's crazy how, uh, at Juno, we're solving uh, the payments for many different companies. We're helping companies really big, really small to make payments online easy. But you see companies like Furbana solving the issue of supply chain for restaurants, for hotels, and you see many more. So we're seeing that the ecosystem is only growing and it's becoming its potential because every time you have a new company, then you have the first employees building their own companies. And it's like kind of like the second, third generation. So compared to the PayPal mafia, it's like, 20, 20 years uh, behind because we're just getting started in the second generation, but uh, we're, what we think we're going to have companies as, as big as uh, Tesla, SpaceX, but made in Latin America. Watch this space for Latin America <laughs> overtaking Silicon Valley. I love it. You know, while you're talking about you know, it'd be great to hear just your own experience as a founder right now in this environment. So I know you started, you know, earlier in the year, around February, I think, and you got some seed funding. What is the funding environment like right now as you're thinking about, you know, scaling your own startup? So it has changed dramatically <laughs> the past couple of weeks. Uh, valuations were cut in half in the next couple of weeks. Um, so. A couple of weeks ago, um, anyone, like it was really easy to raise money. And I think that investors were just being hopeful for many companies that didn't make sense or that the economics weren't clear just to put money and see what happened. That's over. What we're seeing today is that there's still a lot of money to be allocated, but investors are being a lot more careful. Mm -hmm. Um, so even at, you know, when we started June in February, we raised money. I went to my team and the goal was to close all the companies that we could um, and grow uh, at all costs, which is something similar that happens in, in Silicon Valley. Now we completely changed that. We're focusing on revenue. We're focusing on making sure we're building a scalable company. So we still see a lot of funding. A lot of funding is available, but what, what has changed is that you see founders thinking about building a healthy company, building on top of healthy unit economics, building on top of a good and healthy uh, revenue streamline compared to a couple of weeks ago where it was just build something crazy, it doesn't make money, it doesn't matter. Today, it does matter. <laughs> In a matter of weeks, the tide has changed, exactly. And really, yeah. Miriam, that was what you were saying, too, as it relates to building a sustainable business and focusing on unit economics and, and customer growth as opposed to just revenue growth. So I think it's important 
for everybody in Latin America and everywhere in startups to recognize when things change and to make those changes and pivots. Is there anything else you would say that you've seen more broadly inside of your network in terms of the funding environment or the sort of the specifics on what businesses are doing now to deal with the current macro environment? Yeah, so it's very exciting to be here in Collision and see all this innovation, all this technology, all these trends uh, reflected in final products and services. Uh, many of them will become very successful. Hopefully, we'll see some unicorns out of these uh, events. But really, what I see behind these successful companies, it's successful societies, uh -huh. right? Uh, behind all these companies, there are more jobs, more opportunities, equality, uh, inclusion, diversification, and things that can build uh, better societies in general. So my, my advice is about that, right? When you're trying to build your project, think not just on becoming the unicorn, the next unicorn, but really think on the company that will really help to build better societies and a better world. That is very well said. Uh, and it reminds me, when you mentioned diversity and inclusion, I'm going to ask all three of you if you have something to say about this. In the US now, diversity, inclusion, all those kinds of topics are extremely front and center. In the startups that I coach, there's really a focus on diversity and inclusion and wanting to make sure they build an environment like that. Could I ask maybe one of you to weigh in on if that is similar in Latin America, that that's becoming a push that's super important? And if so, what does that look like? I think in my opinion, it has been different because I think in Latin America, um, there have been a lot of discrimination, a lot of different things. But in the startup world, you don't see that. Uh, I think what we're seeing is kind of like a melting pot of different uh, parts of the population, different parts of the, of the just macroeconomic movements. Because if, if you look, for some reason, in Latin America, most of the developers, they tend to come from low-income families. And yeah. now that they're able to work and make money, we're seeing them reaching out and going back to the roots and helping some of their neighbors, some of their friends, get into coding and coming to work startups or, or any big company. So we're seeing um, a closer gap in the income inequality space. And I think it has helped uh, from the startup standpoint. Yeah, very powerful. Yeah, so, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I believe in that part. You know, Latin America is extremely mixed. In my point of view, because uh, somebody can disagree in this part, but in my point of view, has never has been necessary about race, uh -huh. uh, but about in my point of view about classism. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes it has been, you know, that you know people with certain amount of money or certain position in the society can have access to certain type of tools that help them to actually build up companies, um, but no other people that had less, you know, in the society. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And for the, diversif uh, the, the, the diversifying in terms of women, uh, I, for, uh, I, at least in, in my community, I've seen more women coming with different technology uh, companies from Latin America. Very so powerful. I've seen that, that, that certainly is, is closing the gap in that that area. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you to this wonderful panel for really enlightening us around what's going on in Latin American startups right now. And so thank you for your wisdom. Thanks, everybody. Thank